We face challenges today, sometimes feels like overwhelming challenges, but we're not in a unique period of time. People have faced challenges before, have met them, have even succeeded through the obstacles. And that sense that people have is a form of resilience. And so type of resilience I wanna to discuss today in terms of heritage as social action for Newtown in Sarasota, Florida. It's a framework to understand the racial dynamics for this region. I'm Uzi Baram, and I wanna start with a story, a story from more than 20 years ago when I first moved to Sarasota and didn't know much of anything, frankly, about the town and was looking for housing. And I was told that some of the neighborhoods were dangerous, that I should avoid them. Having driven through what seemed like most of the area around uh, New College, I didn't know what people were talking about. And it was only later that I realized that they were referring to Newtown as a place of danger, but I hadn't seen it. Their assumptions were legacies of racism and they were reproducing racist assumptions. It just was falling, not falling onto my ears in the way they wanted to. And it made no sense to me because racism doesn't make sense. The place that they're referring to is Newtown. In 2009, the Sarasota City Commission defined the geography of Newtown by several roads, kind of boxed it in there as a place. But there's another definition for Newtown to that basic question. And it's sometimes referred to as the heritage for Black Sarasota, the communities where there are African Americans in Sarasota. And part of understanding Newtown is understanding that the African American community came here starting in the late 19th century, expanded over the 20th century, and the communities moved northward. And so much of what we have going on is both temporal and spatial. And overarching it is racism. There's lots of ways of talking about racism. Sometimes it's thought of in terms of ethnocentrism or bigotry or xenophobia, uh, basically bad things done by people who are bad. I want to have a different definition, one that comes out of a critical anthropology. Racism is a worldview and a practice that produces social relations in which some people systematically have less res access to resources, power, security, and well-being, while others have much more, create over time through government policies, through laws and statutes, and reproduced over generations of social practices. These systematic inequalities produce patterns of inequalities. Those patterns some are spatial, political, economic. That was the major characteristic of American racism is the assumption that physical characteristics reflect unchangeable inequalities, that I can look and see someone, whether it's in a photo or in person, whether it's old or recent, and know something about them, and of course, something negative about them. And that's when we talk about people being shot for the color of their skin, that's racism, something you can tell something just by the way they look. That's at the heart of American racism, a worldview reproduced over generations. We want to break through that racism and we start by understanding history. We can't understand the history of Sarasota just through Sarasota. And so we start with an acknowledgement, an indigenous acknowledgement that we are uninvited guests on the traditional lands of the Seminole Miccosukee people. We have an obligation and responsibility to respect, honor, and engage the heritage of the indigenous. Once we start with that honor and recognize the long history of peoples on this land, the appropriation of their land, and how that appropriation created more legacies, the more likely we're able to fight against racism. I approach that history is issue of time and space as an archeologist. I don't do it just through excavations, not just through digging. It's by understanding the materiality of people's lives, the spatiality and the temporal components of our way of life. 
And there's a slogan which I've liked, that archaeologists have the unlikely job of saving lives of those who have passed. We don't know a lot about so many of the people who lived here because their lives were not recorded in the histories. By looking carefully at the material record, at the cultural landscape, as treating the documents not as facts, but as artifacts, we can actually save those lives which otherwise are lost. And we start saving those lives by recognizing some of the more recent history. It wasn't long ago that Florida was Spanish. In fact, only in 1821 did the United States get this territory, and 1845 it gained statehood. During that Spanish period, Florida was part of the Underground Railroad, a place for freedom-seeking people, otherwise known as Maroons, who created large-scale Maroonages. Maroon at Fort Rose in the early 17th and 18th century, at Prospect Bluff in the Panhandle in the early 19th century, a series of battles between the Maroons and the U.S. military in Spanish La Florida led the people to go southward, first to Suwannee, then to Angola on the Manitou River, a community of Maroons, of free Blacks, and people who had self-emancipated from enslavement, from the Manatee River down to Sarasota Bay. Hundreds of people living in freedom on this land until 1821 when the community was destroyed. It didn't end. Some moved to the interior where they took part in large-scale warfare known as the Second Seminole War. Others escaped to the British Bahamas where their descendants were able to live in freedom to the present day. Angola is part of this story of African-American Florida. It's a part of the history that's important, although, as you will see in a moment, was erased and not even remembered until archaeological work brought it forward. After, during and after that maroonage, there were people living on the coast. Fishermen from Havana would collect supplies, salt, and fishing nets come up to Sarasota Bay and the other waterways of the Florida Gulf Coast, come and fish, salt and dry the fish, and then bring them back to Havana for the world markets. They create little hamlets known as ranchos, which were marked by a cosmopolitan ethos. These Cuban fishermen, some were of Spanish descent, some were much more complicated. When they created the hamlets, the descriptions of them had people of African heritage, Seminole people, Creek people, some Native Americans who converted to Catholicism who became known as Spanish Indians, as well as some Anglo-Americans. It was a cosmopolitan world that started in the 1770s and lasted into the 1840s. It was only after the 1840s that what we think of as this region started developing. By the end of the 19th century, Communities that are still around today or incorporated into large communities started arising. The village of Manatee, the village of Fruitville, Osprey, Venice. You can see the spelling for Bradenton, which has changed. Parish, Rye is gone, but Sarasota is obviously still around. A whole new geography gets created, bringing in Anglo Americans as well as African Americans. American, as agriculturalists, fishermen, and other entrepreneurs. And it's during that time, after the end of Reconstruction, that segregation develops. It was laws that created divides among people. This is just a small sampling of what the powerful created. The Florida Constitution in 1885 outlawed people marrying and having courtship. And you don't outlaw things that people aren't doing. You outlaw things that people are doing. Schools are created that should be conducted separately. The railroad, the major transportation channel, ended up being divided up. And then the store waiting rooms, the depots were divided up. A creation of spatial divides, social divides that would allow people to assume differences 
because we weren't allowed to interact. The combinations that people would do naturally were prevented by government action. And so we can think about the long history of ancient people going back more than 14,000 years. The 500 years ago, the Spanish first came, the ranch showed them that whole way of life, all of which was cosmopolitan. And then starting in the 1840s, when Whitaker comes to Yellow Bluffs and creates a small family, actually a large family, and begins what ends up turning into Sarasota, the arrival of the Scots in 1885, the rise of the boom times and the Florida dream, all in segregation under a regime of racism. To make sense of this, to bring this to our topic, we'll be thinking about and looking at three parts of contemporary Sarasota. Newtown, North, the Rosemary District near downtown, and of course the downtown area of Sarasota. And to kind of give a sense of differences and the legacies of those segregation laws, we go to the cemeteries where the dead are resting. And there's three cemeteries really within a 10 minute drive of each other that tell three very different stories of Sarasota. Uh, William Whitaker came as a young man to Yellow Bluffs. He went up to the village of Mantee and took Mary Jane as his wife and they produced a large family. Their children and grandchildren stayed in the area and their family plot is just off of the Tamiami Trail, sustained by the daughters of the American Revolution. The big crypt belongs to the uh, William and Mary, and then all of the other children and grandchildren buried around. It's a very nicely maintained cemetery with all the proper concerns. Then there's the Rosemary Cemetery, not far away from it at all. One of the first cemeteries created in contemporary Sarasota back in the 1880s. For a few decades, it was actually in disrepair. But then a group of citizens decided to do something about it, pressure the city into maintaining the lawn, and many of their grave markers and vaults were fixed. And so now, the Rosemary Cemetery, which gives its name to the Rosemary District, is a pleasant little quiet park. And then there's the Galley Cemetery, one of two black cemeteries created for the African-American community of Sarasota, part of the mortuary apartheid of segregation. Only in the last couple of years, as the city of Sarasota started to take care of this cemetery, off of 301, it's difficult to get to because of the busy highway. There's a recycling plant right to its south and a rent a truck place just to its north. It's three very different experiences. And it's not just in death that these individuals experienced a different way of life. They also have experienced different deaths. I had been asked by the city back in 2001, 2002 to survey the Rosemary Cemetery. Again, the citizens were interested in knowing what was there. There wasn't any good inventory of all the grave markers. So with some very nice new college students, we went and inventoried, researched, and organized. And we came across something really interesting because this was built in the days of segregation. It was explicitly the white cemetery. And as we were looking up the various people, we came across right at the entrance to the cemetery, not hidden at all, the Reverend L. Carlson. And it turns out this is the Reverend Carlson, who's a very prominent African-American from the early history of Sarasota. His wife was buried right next to him. Looking at the newspapers, the earliest mention was in 1959, where it's laid out that, yep, that is Lewis Carlson. And this is actually a mystery because there shouldn't be African-Americans buried in the white cemetery, yet it's not hidden. It's quite visible. And it is what makes racism so hard to grasp. It was never simple on any level. The irony is the name of this cemetery overtook the previous name of this town, of this area. It was Overtown, which was the African-American community, became the Rosemary 
district after the Rosemary Cemetery. And much of that black history is forgotten as are some of the exceptions to segregation. We do know a little bit about it. Uh, during the depression, the Great Depression, uh, the federal government paid people to record, document places all around the country. And the WPA Guide for Florida includes an account of Sarasota describing just east of the railroad, shops and churches and recreational centers and rows of shacks. Most of the people pursuing agricultural pursuits, noting it's almost a third of Sarasota was African American. Others worked for the circus, the Ringling Circus, of course, and then would do other odd jobs. It actually gives a sense of a vibrant community in what we refer to, uh, that was referred to as Overtown. Overtown got crowded. And one of the people involved with the Ringling Circus, Charles Thompson, decided that the people of Overtown deserve better housing. And so he created something called Newtown Estates in April of 1914. And this is where we get the term Newtown from this uh, housing development with 96 slots. This was a time period when Sarasota was expanding from agriculture to tourism, encouraging people to come from the north via the railroads, via the segregated railroads, for golfing, swimming, boating, fishing, shooting, baseball, tennis in sunny Sarasota. As people were taking up that offer of visiting, the city of Sarasota realized, the city elders, that much of the history was being lost and would be forgotten. And so in 1977, the city of Sarasota wanted to go beyond the few sites that were listed on the Florida Master Site file and had a survey of buildings constructed prior to 1930, getting a sense of what was there in terms of both buildings, but also archeological sites. But as this is the quote, the city explicitly excluded North Sarasota, North Siestaki and Newtown, just to sign it. And this is where we find the racism that some places were just not seen as significant and Newtown prominently being so, even though it was an old part of town. That sort of work led to a tremendous imbalance until about five years ago. Most of the books on Sarasota really should say the history of white Sarasota, because that's all that was discussed, except for a mention maybe of one or two African-Americans. The only counterweight in the 20th century was a book but Your World of Mine, which was a partial history of African-American Sarasota. That imbalance is not just a scholarly concern. It ended up playing out in popular discourse. A, a terrible event happened in April of 2011. Two British tourists got killed. The Sarasota Herald Tribune decided to use a byline of Newtown for the murders rather than a byline of Sarasota. There was no political entity. There never has been a political entity called Newtown. It's a place where African-Americans in Sarasota live, as I said, even though there's a geography to it. It's not a formal political uh, concept. There's different neighborhood associations within Newtown. And this was awful, but it came about both the newspaper wanting to protect tourism not wanting to scare off tourists from coming in, but also the ne negative perceptions of the neighborhood as a place of danger. A couple of years later, the newspaper tried to redeem itself, always like stories of redemption, and using the 1914 creation of Newtown States as a benchmark, they created a webpage, Newtown 100, a legacy of struggle and triumph back in 2014. And I mentioned Lewis Carlson, there's a little bio on him and his wife, that laid out some of the people and some of the events for Newtown for Black Sarasota. They tried to have some events as well. And if you look closely at these events, uh, you'll see that one is Newtown Landscapes, which was done at the Cook Library. Uh, my work at the Galley Cemetery, 
I was always involved in trying to get people to tell their stories. Uh, not much energy for the centennial of uh, Newtown. But it actually piqued people's interests. Those exhibits, the work on the cemetery, the oral histories. But there was a problem because of the inequalities, because of lack of documentation, because of poverty, as well as some development choices, there wasn't enough material for the formal requirements of historic district. But luckily, there were staff at the city of Sarasota who were innovative thinkers, and they took a notion of a conservation district and used it to create a historic conservation district that would allow Newtown to be organized for its history. On one level, the history was frightening. Right? It's a history of segregation, of divisions, of oppression. But there is another story there as well of courage, determination, and achievements. And that became the focal point. And I'll just uh, pause for a moment. Because what's important to know is that the staff was involved, the newspaper had been involved. What heritage comes out of is not those organizations, but from people. Historic preservation in the United States is a grassroots endeavor. There is not someone in DC or Tallahassee to decide something's important. Citizens band together, organize research, and make an argument that a place is important. And we think of that process as heritage, that when it's effective, places are preserved. When it's not effective, what you see here is the Ringling Towers, it was destroyed. And so there's this constant need for people to be involved. When I talk about heritage as social action, it comes out of that grassroots notion that people need to know and need to care. And for Newtown, it wasn't the legacies of segregation, it was the legacies of courage, determinations, and achievements. And it allowed a flourishing of nostalgia of how things were, which can be but frankly, it is ironic, right? Because it was not an easy time. But that isn't how people saw it. I'll just give you a little background because I think nostalgia is another one of these words that deserves definition. It was coined in the 17th century. It seemed Swiss, Swiss soldiers were unhappy when they were off fighting in war. And a Swiss doctor came up with this term that people have a state of indifference when they're away from home for too long. It's a nice notion. Today, there's actually two types of nostalgia. Uh, the one that most people are aware of is referred to as reactionary nostalgia. This is the elite and politically conservative commemorations. This is remembering, quote, great men and great battles, uh, trying to impose certain themes on the population about inequalities and hierarchies. But it's also a progressive nostalgia, and it is overtly emotional. It's supposed to touch your heart. So it's about remembering actively and self-consciously about achievements and gains in order to create a politically progressive agenda. This progressive nostalgia is actually becoming wildly popular across American cities and even cities elsewhere around the world because of rapid changes. For Sarasota, the progressive nostalgia is not remembering the fear of lynching. It's not remembering the Ku Klux Klan marching. It's remembering achievements as well as struggles. And so with that framework, let me go through some of the history so you know where this came about. We start with contemporary Sarasota. We're not going way back in time. And again, we start with Whitaker coming in December of 1842. He sees Yellow Bluff, Bluffs and sets up a log cabin. He ultimately sets up a fishing business and others. It's a difficult first few years in 1846 and 1848. There's massive hurricanes. Uh, New Pass was named by Whitaker that opened up land uh, to Sarasota Bay. The Seminoles are still very much part of this area. Billy Bowlegs is a painting of uh, what he looked like. Would visit the Whitakers often, as well as village, visit the people in the village of Manatee. Uh, but he had banana groves in what's now eastern Sarasota County, the U.S. military destroyed, setting off the Third Seminole War, the last of a long series of battles 
over the 19th century that pushed Seminoles south into great uh, cypress swamps. It was during this time, and this is from the historic record, there were many Af people of African heritage around this region. Some had been uh, at Angola and stayed, others came into the area. Some probably lived with the Cuban fishing ranchos. But in terms of the history of Sarasota, <coughs> 1857, Bolden comes in, works for the Whitakers, and the romanticized story, probably overly romanticized, is even after freedom, he lives with the Whitakers going all the way to 1904. 1878, Sarasota is established as a post office. We start seeing more of the names that become familiar in Black Sarasota's history. Lewis Colson. Then the Scots arrive. The city is set up through the Florida Mortgage and Investment Company, and churches start being built. First in 1899, the Bethlehem Baptist Church with Lewis uh, Colson as his first minister. Twelve more churches in the next uh, few decades, and over time starts expanding. The railroad comes in first in 1892, then 1903, and just grows and grows. Another important individual in the history is Leonard Reed, who arrives. He becomes a great educator. His children become great educators for Black Sarasota. The Payne Chapel Church is established, and by 1902, Sarasota is recognized as a town by the state of Florida. It's 1905 that the Rosemary Cemetery is given to the city, and this is where some of the racial dynamics come to a head. There's stories in the newspaper that people don't feel safe going through what's now expanding over town that's surrounding the Rosemary Cemetery, the Wright Cemetery. We have more people coming to the area, Wright and Emma Bush, you'll hear about in a few minutes, they open a store. 1914, Charles Thompson sets up Newtown Estates, and shortly after, as the Great War rages in Europe, more than a hundred African Americans leave Sarasota and Bradenton to serve in the U.S. military, and they go up to Massachusetts for training in segregated units, but fighting for freedom. Some of the people buried at the Galley Cemetery had been soldiers during the First World War. The boom times come, the population increases tremendously. Sarasota splits off of Manatee County, but things are difficult. There are Klan rallies in Tampa and Lakeland, massive rallies. People would have known about it. In Sarasota, the Klan Circus goes through town. That's how it's known, the Klan Circus. But the African-American community is committed to its success. Their children can't go to the white schools, so they get go to homes or churches until 1924, when the Rosenwald Foundation contributes to building the Sarasota School, the first public school for African-American students in Sarasota. The fund provides half the money, the other half is raised by African-Americans in Sarasota. More and more people coming, uh, uh, famous white Sarasotan builds a hotel named after Lewis Colson for black travelers. The turpentine industry expands, bringing even more people and an airport develops. Sarasota is on the move, but set as a segregated town. With all of those dynamics, the winds, the wing, winds of change start coming in. Uh, you're all familiar with Brown versus the Board of Education decision. Well, people start demanding their equal rights. And in 1955, people from Newtown got in their cars drove to Toledo Beach and waded in the waters right in front of the police. Sarasota wanted to prevent that, so they opened a swimming pool in Newtown, but the residents wanted to go to the beach and were able to. In 1957, Ed James II, who's just a tremendously important intellectual from Sarasota, is going to college at Florida A&M up in Tallahassee. He comes home for winter break. He wants to borrow some books from the public library. The librarian tells him he's not allowed to. It's segregated. She calls the city manager, Ken Thompson. The famous park is named after him on the keys. He asks Ed, 18-year-old Ed, to come down to see him. 
the city hall was on the water at that point. This was probably a scary moment. Lynchings were happening. African Americans were disappearing. But Ed James II was courageous. He met with the city manager. He explained they wanted to do his schoolwork. Ken Thompson said he could. The library was desegregated. The beaches are desegregated, the libraries, but then comes the schools. They're still segregated in 1961, seven years after the Brown decision. But does it play out in a way that works for the community? Sarasota decides to close the Booker High School, Booker High School named after Emma Booker, a famous educator in the area. Right? What had been the Sarasota School becomes the Booker School and then the Booker Schools, elementary, junior high, and high school. And the students are told to go to Sarasota High School Riverview, further to the south, and they don't want to. They don't want to leave their neighborhoods. They don't want to go into what is hostile campuses. And so they go on strike. And they don't go on strike against learning. They go on strike against the plan. And new college students and high school students teach in what's known as freedom schools until Booker is reopened and is open to this day. This agitation leads to demands for representation. Fred Atkins is one of many who part of a lawsuit to change the elections for city commission from at large to districts. So Northern Sarasota has a district and he wins the seat. There's a more recent picture of Fred Atkins in the far corner. He's elected to city commission and serves as mayor. 1999, Carol Mason is elected to the city commission. 2011, Willie Shaw is elected. He's still serving and has served as mayor of the city of Sarasota. But we don't want to think that it's all okay because it isn't okay. There's a story and a columnist for the Sarasota Herald Tribune put it forward as the mystery behind Sarasota's first black physician. The hospital is also segregated. And a doctor, an African-American doctor, came to Sarasota to heal the sick in Newtown. He was highly respected. He even received privileges at Sarasota Memorial Hospital, the first one to do so. He and his wife belonged to a church. They had social activities. And then one day they found dead in the home in Whitfield Estates, a neighborhood just north of New College. The newspapers claimed it was a murder-suicide. No one believes that. It may well have been a lynching that had occurred in 1965 against a person who heals. There's so many of these stories, some known, some at the point of legend, some people are just not sure about. And then the area that had been Overtown, now the Rosemary District, had agitation. You see here the shock down, you know those shacks? Shotgun houses. This is a very distinctive African-American style of home. It's called shotgun because you open the front door and the back door, you can shoot a shotgun bullet right through it. They were torn down. They're gone. Housing goes up. There's a sign, tremendously important sign on Central Avenue for the first black community. As there was construction, the developer removed the sign Myself and others were concerned. A replica was put up and a demand was to put it back up, to not forget that what's now the Rosemary District was the first black community. That was a fear for Newtown as well. But that historic commission, that, that historic conservation district, widely successful. It was widely successful because of this person, Vicki Aldo. She just had the right touch, the right connections, and was able to do a report but really a heritage movement that has enlivened the history, that's answered so many questions and has generated so much interest in Sarasota.